Wow, what a fantastic crowd we have here. Great to see so many of you here. Thank you for coming. I'm extremely excited to be on stage with the wonderful Pejman Nozad, uh, who has such a fascinating and unique journey into venture capital. Welcome, Pejman. Welcome to Helsinki. Welcome to Slush. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, I, I really appreciated the invitation. Um, a special thanks to people at Slush. It's pretty remarkable. The, the community you have built here and, and the level of enthusiasm. So keep up the good work. And you know, to people of Finland, thank you so much. You are very warm, welcoming. I love your saunas. It's hotter than any AI deals in, in Silicon Valley, so. Thank you, Pejman. I can't wait for us to dive into your story. Uh, but before we dive in, maybe we can set the scene and have a quick overview of where you are today. So if you can have the slides, please. So yes, Peshman, you've been featured on the Midas list for four years in a row. And you are also ranked number one on the Midas seed list. For those who are unfamiliar with the Midas list, it recognizes the top VCs in the world. It's a well-earned spot if you look at your, your <laughs> Investment. So you've invested into companies that are now worth over $200 billion. Very impressive. And including port portfolio companies like DoorDash, Dropbox, or AppLovin. And Petman, you also, with your Pair VC team, just closed your fourth fund. $432 million. Very impressive. Congrats on that as well. Thank you. And also in 2014, you received the Ellie Island Medal of Honor uh, for your contribution to America as an immigrant. And that's where we are today. Yes. Let's not go forward yet. So basically, the story started somewhere way uh, else. And actually here, I have a photo of you sleeping in an attic of a yogurt shop. So can you take us back in time uh, into when you moved to the US? What is happening here in this photo and how did you become the venture capitalist you are today? Yes, well, thank you so much for the preview. I actually was homeless in 1992 in Silicon Valley. And yeah, I slept in this uh, uh, attic above the yogurt shop and I'll go a little bit back a few months before. I, I came from Iran straight to America with no plans. Actually, I went to Germany, I got, um, a place to play soccer and, and go to university. My brother pushed me to go to US embassy. So with no plan, I arrived in America. I only had $700 cash and I didn't speak one word English. Um, but that wasn't the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge was I actually, I was in love with the girl back home in Iran and I thought I'm gonna lose her. So I, it's better to call her every day. And this is 1992, there was, there was no WhatsApp, no internet phone. So I, I was going to pay phone with bag of quarters, 25 cents, calling her every day and the money was gone. So um, in few weeks I had no money, I had no plan, I didn't speak the word English, any word. Uh, so I, I, I said I have to find a job that doesn't require the Eng English language. I bought a 1973 Chevrolet for five payments of 150 bucks and I managed to find an Iranian dealer to negotiate in Farsi. <laughs> so, I drove every day for an hour to San Jose and I washed cars for 10, 11 hours a day. So my first job in America was washing cars. Um, but I rest assured you I was the best car washer the world has ever seen. I wash cars like nobody <laughs> else. Uh, my English improved. I landed that, this job at the yogurt shop, but I ran out of money. I slept in my car. I slept on the street. I remember I only had $7 per day for food, so I managed to go to at the uh, all you can eat in our neighborhood at 6 p.m. because it was the last time and they were giving away, they were giving away like uh, bread and you know, croissant. So that $7 bought $30 for the wood. So it was all surviving and I, um, I begged the owner of the yogurt shop to let me sleep in an attic and I lived there. Like this is literally an attic that was above the yogurt shop. There was no window, short ceiling and I had to go uh, every night out to take oxygen because there's nothing there. But 
again, I, I survived and I felt that if I can survive this, I can do anything in my life. Um, so waking up every morning at 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., then going to college. But something magical happened. Uh, one of the nights I saw an advertising for um, a Persian rug store in downtown Palo Alto, right next to Stanford University, and I got that job. I became a rug salesman. Wow, is this actually a photo of you in the rug gallery? <laughs> Wow. Yes, that's me. It's actually, <laughs> I was dressing up every day going, and I became a really good rock salesman. Um, I, I, saw, I remember one year I sold $2 million worth of rugs, which typically our companies will die before they get to $2 million ARR. But, uh, and Persian rugs, it's, you know, 95% of transaction happens at people's home. Mm -hmm. You come to our gallery and say, Pageman, I bought a home in San Francisco. We look at certain rugs and bring it to your home. So by going to people's home after six, seven years, I realized all of my clients are top venture capitalists. These are Doug Leone's of the world, or John Doerr and founders of Yahoo. And I was really in a maze of, when I asked what you do, uh, they were all in technology. I actually thought businesses, you build this and you sell it. I never knew you can build massive company based on knowledge. And I felt I have this amazing access mm -hmm. to these incredible people that you normally cannot go to your home. And I'm hanging out with Doug Leone, having barbecue and selling rugs at the same time. And I, I decided I want to be one of these people. So I started to ask a lot of questions. I, um, I learned things that they openly shared with me. And this is really credit to Silicon Valley. They never judged me. They opened their arms and shared everything with me. And I went back to the owner of the rug shop because I didn't have money. And I, um, I asked him to partner with me to invest in startups. So we started to do angel investing late 90s when it wasn't really fashionable. And we made terrible investments. We, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. Uh, but I kept going. I learned the business day by day. And I kept pushing myself. And you know, we ended up being the first investor in many great companies, including Lending Club, Danger, Dropbox. And, and I made money, but I paused here because, and then I started the firm, but I paused here. That was somehow how I got to the venture, to the investing at the early days. Wow, that's such an inspiring and impressive journey. <laughs> really, wow. And maybe you could actually focus on one of the companies that you invested in. So uh, here's a fo uh, photo of you, Mike Moritz from Sequoia, and then Araj, the co-founder of Dropbox. Can you take us back to this moment? And what did you think in the early days? Why did you decide to invest into Araj and Drew? This is one of my favorite photos. This is where Dropbox started. It was two people. R. Ashford-Dosi, who was an MIT dropout, and actually the photo was taken by Drew, the CEO. And this is Sir Michael Moritz. If you don't know, uh, Mike Moritz is one of the best venture capitalists of all time. At that time, he was on the board of Google and Yahoo. So I met Drew and Arash. I really liked what they did. <laughs> and I managed to take Mike Moritz to their apartment. They didn't have an office. And by um, Monday night, we had a round together. It was they raised $1.2 million at $5 million valuation, which is unheard of today in, in Silicon Valley. And I became really good friends. It was one of the you know, um, moments for me mm -hmm. to be associated with such an amazing and important company. But uh, yeah, I think it's just a great story and Dropboxes keep going right now. Exactly, and here's actually, if you fast forward like a decade forwards, here's the Dropbox IPO, and that's you, Aras and Ru, right there in the middle, and I, I see you look very excited. Yeah, I'm actually how more excited feel? than the founder, as like you can see, it's pretty <laughs> yeah. incredible that how excited I was. But you know, the reason I want to talk about Dropbox, and especially for entrepreneurs in the audience, when we talk about these glorious companies, we always think about these moments, but every company starts at day zero, even minus one. I think. The, the way you look at how, what you built and how you built it is look at the previous photo that that company, that, that apartment can become a $10 billion company one day. And that's really the power of technology and being an entrepreneur. And how do you then maintain that relationship with these founders where you're at the very earliest stage and then until the IPO? How does it change in between? You know, in the early days, even at our firm today, we worked with them the first three years, mm -hmm. but I kept really close relationship with the, with the founders. One of the things I do when our companies grow and are out of our investment, kind of the profile, every six months or one year, I send an email to the founders, Drew, and said, what are the three things you need? And, you know, I, make, I, I move mountains to actually deliver one of them. So, and actually be kind to them, be good to them. And, you know, today, 
actually they are investors in my fund. So that's pretty incredible that, you know, invest in that, in that apartment and they become your LP. Amazing, it comes around, yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, actually here in 2013 then, uh, you founded PairVC with Mar. Uh, and now you're a team of 25 people managing over $850 million. Uh, what was the start of Pair VC and how has it gone that now you have a team of 25? Yeah, so I, um, I started to do angel investing on my own. Around 2009, I realized there's an opportunity to build an institution to serve founders at day zero. The question was, can I walk to a room like this and say I'm your best partner, take my money? And the answer was no. Mm. Although I had a great track, track record, everybody knew me, but I never built a cheap product. I actually never worked for the tech startup. And so I knew I want a partner who has been an entrepreneur. And then Mar, I know Mar now for 24 years. Um, I was very lucky to invest in her second company. And um, for four years, I didn't talk to anybody. And she said, you know, you're crazy. You don't know venture, I don't know venture. Um, but I convinced her, actually I tricked her. I said, okay, don't worry, uh, don't, don't join me, but why did you come to, there's a very famous cafe next to Stanford University called Coupa Cafe. Mm -hmm. Everybody is there. I said, why did you come to Coupa after work and meet founders with me and provide feedback? So it worked. Um, Amazing. <laughs> she, she was glued to it. So we started Pair VC in a tiny cafe um, and we want to build the best seat firm ever existed. Mar and I, we are um, yin and yang. I'm a college dropout, she's a Stanford PhD. Um, I think she has 14, 15 patents, I have zero patents. She's a professor at Stanford, but great complementary skills. So fast forward today, um, you know, by, by numbers, we are a top 5% performing fund in the world. Um, we have a team of 25 people. Our investment team have started and sold 13 companies, so there are a bunch of entrepreneurs, but we provide beyond investment um, advice. Uh, so we have a platform, mm -hmm. for example, we have four senior recruiters in-house that they hire um, employees for free for our companies. Last 18 months, I'll give you an example, we hired 133 people for our companies. We built the biggest AI studio in the world, the 30,000 square feet office in San Francisco. I really encourage you, if you are in San Francisco, come and see it. It's just pretty remarkable what's going on over there. And you know, we, 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 I, I think we reached our own product market fit after 11 years, it's about to, to grow, but listen, I look back at what Sequoia and Greylock have done and, and companies like Benchmark found, I think there's so much to do for us, we haven't done much. And uh, I wake up every morning, I think this is the day we're gonna fund the next Google or Microsoft, but at the same time, I feel this is the same day we're going out of business. So my days are a combination of, of dream and paranoia. Amazing to hear. And is there something um, from your background or from ju your journey that you've brought into Pair VCs day to day? You know, my job changed. So I, obviously, yeah. we're two. Now is all about team building, yeah. making sure we stay focused, we stay hungry, we stay humble. I spend a lot of my time in recruiting, yeah. like make sure we recruit the right team. But I, I make investment, I support everybody in the firm. You know, I play professional soccer. Actually, I played in Iran in, in a, one of the biggest soccer team. I feel that Pair is a soccer team, everybody plays, we just want to win. And you know, we have different responsibility. Mm -hmm. If my team come and say, Pejman, I know you're the captain of the team, but you have to sit on the bench, I sit on the bench. So I, I support my team. Makes sense. And then uh, we can discuss another of your success stor stories, which is DoorDash. Uh, so you turned a $1.9 million investment into 375 million return. Uh, what made you excited about DoorDash in the beginning? Yeah, it's a great story after Mickey was here <laughs> and it's pretty remarkable that they're partners with DoorDash exactly. now. Um, so we met the founders of DoorDash when they were four students at Stanford. They, they used to work in a home next to uh, Stanford University. And it wasn't like that, we mapped the market and we thought, oh, um, delivery is a big business. In fact, when they started, uh, the estimated market in America was only $3 billion. Um, but we met an incredible team who are committed to solve a real problem. Um, and we spent time, at the time that DoorDash started, by the way, um, there were 20 other companies doing the same thing. Uh, but once we started to meet Tony and the rest of the team, it was very clear, this is the team we wanted back. One, they were all mathematicians and scientists, they want to build a technology company. Two, they never touched the food. So many companies said, we make the food and deliver. We, we knew the unit economics was not there. And the, from the beginning, Tony, the CEO, never said that this is a delivery company. He said, DoorDash is going to enable in 
e uh, local e -co local commerce to grow, and we're going to solve the first problem they have, which is delivery. And then stock to it even today, um, it's pretty remarkable. So we invested in seed, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Then we invested in Series A, four hundred thousand dollars. Sequoia did. I think the biggest decision Mar and I, my partner, made was at Series B because you know when you have fifty million dollars fund and Series B was at $600 million valuation, and it wasn't really clear who is the winner, Uber was coming, people questioning uh, delivery, and we put $1.2 million out of fund one, which is only $50 million. So even some of our LPs got very uh, nervous, and you know, we, uh, it, you know, from 600 million today, $70 billion. So it's, it, today it looks like no brainer, but at that time yeah. it was a difficult decision. So one of my advice to any manager here who's starting, like you really want to double down on your winners and go all in. And, and that, was, uh, that was the whole reason. By the way, uh, I haven't sold a single shares of DoorDash. That's how much I believe in the company. So. Wow, amazing. That's impressive. <laughs> Uh, and you have written a lot of these early checks, so it's not to DoorDas and Dropbox, but also like AppLave and Gusto. And so, uh, what's the common characteristics with these founders that you've built into? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the typical things that generally you heard from everybody is like you want to make sure that the founders deeply understand mm -hmm. the market and problem. They can um, really. Um, share a lot of information, they're, they're committed to be entrepreneur. I spend a lot of time getting to know the founders and the chemistry between the team. Um, so that's very important for me because if they can get along, there is no clear um, understanding who makes what decision. It's very hard to fix it as a venture capitalist down the road. Um, but there are things that I've seen among the best entrepreneurs, like one, they are paranoid in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. They wake up every morning, they have this vision, but they question themselves. I think they're captain of the ship. They believe their team and their customers is beyond them. They are lifetime learners. They actually, as the company grow, they grow. Like when, we, when I met Drew, the CEO of DoorDash, I'm the CEO of Dropbox, he was a hacker and he never managed a person, but he taught himself to, to be a leader. In fact, um, I, I took 20 students one day, lunch with, with Drew, and one of the students says, how did you become a leader of a $10 billion company as being a hacker? He said, listen, when we st I started Dropbox, I, um, I, was, I never managed a, a, a single person, but I felt that I can commit myself, I can, I can grow. And he started to read books. You know, by the way, you, you should search Drew Houston book recommendation. There's a, there are 23 books he recommends every founder should read, and I encourage you to, to check it out. And now he's not only a CEO of uh, Dropbox, he's on the board of Meta. Think about it. So, um, you know, the best founders are lifetime learners. And, uh, and the other one is that just go to the areas that they're, they're weakness and they become the best at what their weakness was. Like, if you're, they're not a good public speaker, they become the best public mm -hmm. speaker. So go to the places that you're uncomfortable and become really good at it. I think that's a great tip for everyone in the audience as well. But uh, what would be your best learnings then for the investors and the managers um, in the audience uh, from what you've learned during this time? You know, I think you, you, the, the number one advice or suggestion I give to investors is like ask yourself why founders should raise capital from you and have a clear answer. So find your superpower and double down on it. In the world of so much capital, entrepreneurs have so many options, so why taking money from Pair VC? We, every day, we want to make sure that we have the right answer for them. That makes total sense. And also, interestingly, I read about you guys that you don't hire just traditional VCs into Pair VC, but you have another strategy. Can you share a bit more about that one? Yeah, we actually never hired an investor in yeah. Pair. It's everybody, the investment team are either entrepreneurs or early operators because at the stage we get involved, there's an idea, a prototype, you have to go on the whiteboard. And if you haven't been a founder, it's very hard. So, but we train them, they come to, to our companies, to, to our firm and we train them as an investor. We can't train them to be founder, but we can train them to be investor. That makes sense. And as we're nearing uh, kind of the end as well, uh, is there some tips or something that you would like to say to the founders in the audience now that are listening and wanting to build the net, net, next Dropboxes and DoorDashes? I can say that uh, nothing extraordinary is easy and often is unpredicted. And you know, success comes to people who, um, 
who keep pushing. Um, I think setbacks is part of the journey. Um, I survive because of my commitment to myself. So I think uh, perseverance is the key. That makes total sense. Um, also, one more thing that came to my mind. You told about the story that you were calling this girl uh, back home. What happened? What do you think? Um, we just celebrated our 31st anniversary, so. Amazing, congrats, congrats. And it's yeah, this. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's her and my two, two beautiful children. Oh, wow. That's a wonderful story. Uh, but yeah, I think thank you, Pejman. Thank you so much uh, for having you. me. This was a great conversation. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.